<laughs> Good morning, St. Beach Bible Church. So glad to see everybody today. This is the Lord's Day. He is risen. He is risen Okay, so when I was a kid, uh, and those of you don't know about my testimony, I was actually saved when I was eight years old. So when I was a kid, reading the Bible, you know, it, it's kind of like a chore. You know, kind of right up there with weedy. <laughs> Not a big proponent of weedy. There's a, there's a verse in the Bible, which is Jeremiah 15, 16. This, it says this. It says, And your word became the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, the Lord God of hosts. And I had a hard time wrapping my mind around how those things that I was reading that I was this is crazy. This is crazy. Leviticus, get out of here. I just couldn't understand how anybody could feel that way or how they could think of the Word of God, you know, that, wow, this is joy. It was a chore. It was very difficult. But when, I, you know, when a good writer, I'm talking about nowadays, we know that there were a lot of good writers in the Bible, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. But when a good writer is planning to write a novel or, or a TV show or a movie or something like that, um, they go through a process presenting the protagonist, this is the person that the, book or the movie or TV is about, they, they, they present them uh, using a system that's simply known as character development, okay? Uh, there are two types of characters that you develop, there are two different ways that you develop characters. One is called a static character, one is called a dynamic character. And it's, you know, it's a literary device that helps you to grab the audience's attention and bring them into the story. They actually begin to care what happens to this particular character. And I don't know if you guys are anything like me, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, if I'm watching a TV series or something like that, you know, it takes a couple of shows, you know, before you're like, hey, okay, I'm going to stop. This is, okay, I'll watch one more. Oh, okay, I'll okay, one more. Then, oh, wait, this started to get interesting all of a sudden. And it's because you're starting to care about what happens to the characters or what happens in this character's life. And that's part of what the writer is trying to accomplish, is to get you to latch on whatever is taking place. Um, so it's essential, you have to care about the characters to be able to engage in the story. So the Bible is very, very much like this, but it has a couple of essential differences that I want to point out this morning. First, we have the static character of God. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the exact same from the very beginning of the story until the very end of the story. He never changes. He is a static character. Nothing is going to take place or, or, or change in any way. And then we have a whole lot of dynamic characters in the Bible, and a lot of them we can really relate to. I mean, you think about David, okay? Think about Thomas, the elder. Think about Peter, you know, how he denied Christ and those kind of things. And you think, wow, that these, these characters were all about change in their life. They were dynamic characters in the Bible that presented us with a character that we can relate to and that we can actually even begin to care about because we can see something in ourselves in each one of those characters. I'm sure somebody, I'm sure everybody in here this morning has spent any time reading the Bible probably has a, a favorite character that you're like, man, I relate to that guy. You know? I mean, that's exactly my struggle. I get it. And there's hope for me because in the end, you know, we hope, we hope nobody's favorite character is Jesus. <laughs> but, okay, so so the difference is the difference is in the Bible is is you know and you guys will recognize this alive and active alive and active because the Bible is alive and active it has the ability to not just present us with characters that are dynamic and static character of God within the Bible but it's living and active and so it's the it has the ability to draw us ourselves in and, and, and teach us things and to change our lives dynamically because of the words that are written to us. So when I was young and reading God's Word, I had not yet learned to care about the characters in the story. I didn't have that. I had not learned to identify with the change within the narrative and how these characters were being developed in the Bible and the things that were happening in the most important ways. Most importantly, I had not yet experienced dynamic change within myself. It comes to, as you begin, to deeply care for the author and the change of God himself. 
So just like a regular novel or movie or TV show, it doesn't happen or won't happen unless you engage with the characters. We have to engage with the guide, the author of the Bible, through the Holy Spirit for us to be able to really feel that joy that Jeremiah experienced at the Word of God. It's very, very important. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any trick sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Verse 12, just like we talked about, alive and active. We got 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So one of the greatest things that happens is we begin to care deeply for the author which is God. Um, the characters found in the Bible, those, those characters as well, we're going to begin to see evidence and deeper meaning within those stories. The Bible opens up to us. It is alive and active. It begins to show us not just the, the words on the page, but what the meanings behind those words are and how they can apply to our own life. Um, the Bible is full of types. Well, we've probably talked about this before. It's full of types. Persons and events there are a foreshadowing of persons and events that have not yet taken place. We see Joseph's character in, in, in Genesis. And Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. There are many things within Joseph's life that are patterns and types that we can see that also took place with Jesus. And that's intention. This is the greatest author that author that's ever written a book. Right? He, I mean, he invented all literary components, all literary devices, and he uses many of them. For our, for our benefit. Um, we also, not many of you will know who, when I say Antiochus Epiphanes, will know who that is. It was the Seleucid king who attacked Israel in, uh, in uh, 167 BC and destroyed, you know, the temple and desecrated the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes is a type, you read the book of Daniel, Antiochus Epiphanes is a type, a foreshadowing of what the Antichrist is going to be like. And actually, many things that Antiochus Epiphanes did in desecrating the temple, the Antichrist will do those exact same things. So when we see those prophecies in Daniel that foretold of Antiochus Epiphanes, we will also see those same things when the Antichrist stands in the temple and declares himself to be God. Last week we talked about the Israel in the desert before they were allowed to come into the promised land. And we saw that, that the crossing over the Jordan of Jordan was a type it was a picture for us to look at and say that is God's rest. That is like those who are loyal to, to Jesus, those who have claimed Jesus, God, and, and we've, we go into heaven. That is going to be God's rest that they were not allowed to have because they did not believe as they should have believed. This morning I want to share types with you from Genesis chapter 49. Uh, let me set the stage. Okay, so we have Judah, or Israel, as God changed his name later on. Uh, he is in Egypt. Um, he is there about to, about to die. Uh, and he's taking his family, obviously, to Egypt to escape the famine that was in the land, you know, of Canaan, where they, where they left from. And uh, he's taking them there, and he has his son, jo uh, Joseph. We, we just talked about Joseph a minute ago. You know the story. Joseph was sold into slavery for his, for his brothers. He went through a whole lot of hardships. He ended up being the second command only to Pharaoh over Egypt and was sent there by God to save Israel. Basically, that is exactly the reason that the things that happened to him happened. And just an aside, we're talking about Jacob and Israel, whichever one we want to call him by. He was himself one of those dynamic characters that we talk about in the Bible. He's a literary Christ all unto himself. I mean, here you have a liar and a cheat who was transformed by the, by the power of God by wrestling with Jesus himself. You see him being transformed throughout his entire life to the very father of Israel and to an incredible prophet in a prophetic nature to him that you would never expect to have come from a cheat, from a liar. But that's exactly what took place. So I want to look at uh, some of that prophecy this morning. We want to talk about it a little bit and, and see if we can find our own type within the blessings, and it's some may say curses, that Judah puts on his sons at the time of his death. 
is death. Now we have to understand, first off, that's normal. Okay, when you think you're about to, you know, you're about to give up the ghost on earth, if you're an Israelite, you call all your sons in and you lay your head upon or your hand upon their head and you give them a blessing. And you give them whatever their inheritance is going to be. You proclaim that over them. So at your death, there's no questions. There's no arguing or attorneys or anything. Well, it's all been done in advance. And so everybody knows. So let's, uh, let's take a look at it. Jacob called to his sons and said, Gather yourselves together so that I may tell you what will befall you in the last days. Okay, that sentence is really important for us to be able to understand. We'll talk about that in a minute. Why? Gather yourselves together and hear sons of Jacob, and listen to your father of Israel. Okay, so there we got daddy in the bed, and all 12 sons gathered around to find out what daddy has to say. Um, now we understand that we had read chapter 48 before we started here that Jacob, Israel, had already blessed Joseph's sons, uh, Eph Ephraim and Manasseh. He had already blessed them, and therefore gave Jacob a double portion of the inheritance by blessing his sons. Uh, that's already been done, so we're not going to cover that. That's just that's just history. Uh, so we're going to clearly see through these blessings that you know that they're going to point out some of the boys' good characteristics and bad characteristics, and they're also going to point towards what they were going to inherit, what they were going to inherit when the tribes, you know, some four hundred some years later after they got out of the captivity in Egypt, were going to look forward to when they entered. Promise Much of the Bible prophecy we know has double prophetic meaning. This also has double prophetic meaning. Just like I said, their land grants, the, the land that they were granted, the tribes in the future were granted, were, were, were perfect prophecy. Every one of them was exactly as Daddy here had said it was going to be. But, remember, last days. Last days. Very, very important. Um, when the Assyrians conquered and carried off the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC, all the tribes except Benjamin and Judah were lost in history. I mean, in fact, today they call the ten tribes that were in the northern kingdom the missing tribes. We don't know where they are. They have been lost in history. They've been assimilated into the populations of places that they went. Now, Judah and Benjamin remained faithful and only married within their own groups. And so they kept the lineages going. And so we know people that were born in the tribe of Judah. We know people that were born to the tribe of Benjamin, even in times of today. But all the other ten tribes, who knows? Who knows, right? Uh, so it's important for us to recognize this prophecy as a spiritual one that's not yet completely completed. It's partially completed. We can all look at it today. We can see types that probably each one of us have. And that's what we want to look at. We want to identify what those are today. Um, it's also really important to note that there are some of these blessings that will seem more like curses. I mean, some of them seem incredibly harsh. And, and, and they can be. They can be curses, or they can be curses that God will turn into something else. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, so we have to look at it in a spiritual sense if we're trying to figure out which one of them we resemble. Because everybody in the room. Everybody that's here today, if you were a child of God, if you were a Christian, you will resemble one of these types. So there's, there's 11 types that we're going to go over this morning. So I want you guys to look very, very closely at them and see if you can locate which one of the sons, which one do you relate to? Which son speaks to the way you feel about life and the way that you carry out your life? All right, so let's get started. A lot of scripture I'm going to go over Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might. In the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power, unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled him. He went up to my couch. Well, that sounded really good to start with. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. So, you know, well, water's not real stable. <laughs> it's just not stable at all. Reuben was impulsive. He was an incredibly impulsive kid. He had already lost his birthright because of the sin lying with his father's concubine. Okay, that was the mother of Dan and Nathar, two of his brothers. Um, Reuben had many talents. He was a talented guy. But as we spoke about two weeks ago, he was plagued by a spiritual stronghold. He allowed a spiritual stronghold to control 
his life. He had no self-control. Okay? And even though there were things that he did that were very good, like he's the one that talked the brothers into not killing Joseph and throwing him in a pit instead, you know, there were things in his life where he did the right thing. He was also very compulsive and very, very lacking in self-control. Uh, succumbing to the passions of the flesh can be costly to a Christian. Not having self-control can be incredibly costly to a Christian. Reuben's type is the definition of being the double-minded man that we see in God's word. But we can never excel. We can never excel in God's word if we remain a type of Reuben. But let us ask in faith without wavering, for he who wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed with the wind. Let not that man think that we that he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Now our next type is represented by two brothers. Basically, I told you there were 11 types, right? Two brothers fall into the next category together, and that was uh, Simeon and Levi. Let's see what Dad had to say about these two. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let my glory not be united with their assembly. For in their anger they killed men, and in their self-will they hamstrung, hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Woo! What did these guys do? <laughs> What, what would cause that kind of a proclamation from a father onto a son? Back uh, many years earlier, one of the sisters of the brothers was raped and kind of taken hostage by uh, one of the leaders of an Arab group that lived in a, an adjoining town. And so these two guys, they come up with a concocted story because the, the boy really wanted to marry the, 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 you know, the boy. Of course, that was not allowed uh, in Israel. But he was really adamant. I love her. I love her. You know, please let me marry her. And so they came up with a plan. And uh, the, the plan was, was, well, we can't allow it unless you're circumcised. And so because the guy, the, the dad of the son that had done this, was, uh, it was the leader of the town, he agreed and everybody in the entire, every male in the entire town was circumcised. Well, and I don't remember when that happened to me. <laughs> Thank goodness, but it's supposed to not be a lot of fun. And three days later, Levi and Simeon came through the town. They killed every single male in the entire city. Every single one. And the, the father was aghast and telling you know, I, I mean, not that there wasn't room for righteous anger. Okay, there was. There was room for righteous anger because obviously something had happened to their sister. Now there's a great difference between, like I said, between righteous anger and sinful self-willed anger. They were driven to the second one, to the sinful self-willed anger. And, and here's where you have to have the spiritual understanding and understand where the, the interesting prophecies of this thing come from. Uh, so if this type is you, if you have a tendency towards self-willed anger, if you have a tendency to not be able to control that anger, then you must unharden your heart and you have to change. See, we have those two examples. We have one is Levi and one is Simeon. Levi, who became faithful, and although his father's curse was fulfilled because they were scattered all over the land of Israel, they did not have an inheritance of their own. They had cities within all of their brethren's territories. They were scattered, and yet that scattering itself, because they became faithful, became a blessing to both the tribe, their tribes and to all of Israel. Because. Does it not say that God can turn all things to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose? Yes. So it makes that, I mean, if that is you, there is a way out. But look at Simeon. What happened to Simeon? Simeon, on the other hand, when they left Egypt, he was the third largest tribe by census when they, when they left Egypt. By the time they were taken over, the northern kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians, Simeon had ceased to exist. It was no longer a tribe. They had been scattered and, it, and really had been absorbed by Judah. They no longer had their own identity. They were gone. A, heart, a hard heart, a self-willed anger can lead to destruction. Okay. Therefore, if the Holy Spirit
Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of temptation in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they have always been astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Be attentive, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart to be depart from the living God. That's the ultimate scattering. That is the ultimate dissolution is to go away from the living God. But uncontrolled anger is a is a very, very difficult thing. You just gotta give it up. Give it up to God and let him take care of that. Be a Levi, not a city. Our next brother is our Lord Jesus is tried, Judah. Yes, Judah. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches and lies down like a lion. And as a lion, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver form from between his feet until Shiloh comes. By the way, Shiloh is Jesus. Um, and to him will be the obedience of the people. He tethers his foal to the vine and his colt to the choicest vine. He washes his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. When it talks about tethering your donkey to vines, when it talks about washing your clothes in wine, when it talks about all of those things, this is, this is the original prosperity gospel. Judah had told his son, you are going to be prosperous. You are going to be, in, you know, this is where the kings came from, from David all the way down. All of the kings of Judah were from this tribe, from the tribe of Judah. They would, the scepter would never leave their hands. We know that Jesus has the scepter. He is from the tribe of Judah. He is the lion of Judah. We're supposed to be being conformed to the image of the son. This is what we would look like. This is what we would expect. This is the blessing that this type of Christian would have upon their life. If we could emulate, only emulate our own Lord, which is what God calls us to do in obedience, is to emulate our Lord. If we could do that, this is the type of Christian that we would be. We see what blessings befall this son, this type, this Christian. The exciting stuff we can possess that separate, that same power through the Holy Spirit for the birth of our Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I think it says it all. I think I need to add another word. That's exactly what what is going on. So, next up, Zebulun. Okay? Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the sea, and he shall be a haven of ships. His borders shall, shall be at Sidon. Alright, Zebulun. Okay, now we need to assure some prophetic accuracy. Right? Um, the word, first off, the word that's translated here as sea in the original Hebrew language is, is actually plural. It means seas. So it's, it should say, Zebulun shall dwell at the haven of the seas. That means that the land between the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee would belong to Zebulun. Now, if you go home and you Google a 12 tribes map, you will see that Zebulun is landlocked. Well, wait a minute, something's wrong with the prophecy. Every other son, if you look at what this prophecy tells us, and you look at what happened when Joshua drew lots to see who would inhabit what which piece of property, it wasn't predetermined. It wasn't, you know, except for the ones that were on the east side, it wasn't predetermined. It was all done by lots. It's like, okay, who gets partial number one? Okay, you know, you're, you're in. Zebulun was number three. Okay, so what type of Christian? What, what, would, what would this be? What would it look like? These are the comforters. These are, these are those that, you know, because it talks about being a safe haven in a time of tempest. If, 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 if you're a safe haven to somebody, 
That means that that's the person I'm meeting. You may know somebody. You may go like, man, if I'm in, you know, if I'm in distress and I need comfort, who am I going to call? Who am I going to call? Who is that person that you can always count on to be a comforting word, to be a peacemaker? These Christians are always in really high demand. This is, these are like everybody's best friends. It's like, who am I going to call? Who's always giving me the best? Because they have the gift, the spiritual gift of kindness. But they always have soothing work in the church. This is a cool type. This is a, a very essential type in the church today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Very big type. Through that type, catch yourself on that. That's a good type. That's a good type. Next up, we have this accord. Okay, just a warning ahead of time. This, this type is not a desirable type. Okay, so I'm just going to let you know because you know nobody wants to be a donkey. All right? so, I, I think, I'm pretty sure. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear the burden and became a slave to forced labor. In history, in history, even though Issachar was a strong tribe, was a strong tribe, they were constantly being harassed by arrows on the northeast of them. And instead of fighting for their piece of land, they just kind of laid down and they took up the burden of extra work to pay tribute to these Arab, this Arab nation to keep them from messing with them. Instead of fighting for themselves, fighting for their families, fighting for their right, fighting for that land grant, they just were like, eh, you know, we'll just work extra hard and make a little extra money to pay everybody off. This is what history was doing. Okay? Um, they preferred the bondage. They preferred the bondage to using the strength at their disposal to end that bondage. Those that remain in bondage to sin, or especially in the spirit of fear, these are Issachar types. These are the types that you know, remain in the bondage of sin, can't get up, can't get past it, and will just rather just lay down between, you know, between two piles of stuff than to do something about it. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the sufferings of the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not by our works, but by his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You know, we've been called to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the bondage, not bondage to anything, not fear, not people, not purposes, not places, nothing. The only thing that we are supposed to be in bondage to is Jesus Christ. Not bondage to you, brothers. This is not, this is not a good type. In fact, it's, but it's a very prevalent type. Very, very prevalent type. Especially in the world, but this is a type. Spirit of fear. Everything. You see it all around these people are like scared of everything. Boom! Shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a very controlling type. If you find yourself in with that predicament, if you find yourself in that place, just understand God. God's all God is in control. God is sovereign. Pray that that will be removed from you. It's you know, not a good time. By the way, just don't mention this letter. You know, you can change your time. So, so just in case you know you found yourself to be in a type that you're not particularly fond of, just understand, when we get to that at the end, you can change your type. It's not something that you're always stuck with. It's, it's possible to, to, to change. Okay? So how about Brother Dan? Let's take a look at Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the road, a viper on the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider will fall backwards. Now, this is an interesting prophecy. It says that Dan will judge. All right? 
There's only one judge in the history of Israel, 17 judges. There's only one judge in the history of Israel that was from this realm. It was the Okay, so you, know, you would think, well, okay, so I guess it did come true in the physical by one point, that this is so much more of a spiritual thing than anything else. That the, the serpent, the, the serpent terminology here makes a lot of um, you know, a lot of scholars, biblical scholars, say that this is the tribe that the Antichrist will come from. That's what they say. Now, the tribes are missing, so I mean we have no proof of that, but it very well could happen. We very well could find that out at some point in the future. There's no real way to tell this. Um, but we want to look here at the spiritual implications of what it's actually doing. Matthew 10, 16 says this. Look, he's talking to his disciples. He says, look, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is how Jesus instructed his disciples to approach their ministries. Okay? Wise as serpents, gentle as doves. Discern, but don't be offensive. Discern, but let people see the calmness upon you. Discern, but don't fall under any kinds of sin. Okay, discernment is a very important. Judge rightly be able to do that. You know, we, we hear uh, Matthew 7 1 says that this is like the, the least understood verse in the entire Bible. It says, Judge not, lest you be judged in the same way. That very last part is very, very important. Okay, because the Bible actually, in, in just about every other thing that talks about judgment, says, yes, that's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to judge. We are supposed to look at things and discern things and be able to know the difference between right and wrong and to know between who is coming with a pure heart and who isn't when, when they enter the doors of the church. We're supposed to be able to, to, to judge that and to see that. This, especially with people's actions. Those are things that we're supposed to be uh, with, uh, understand. And that's all spirit provided wisdom. May seem weird on the surface. Yeah, can't, can't, can't figure it out on the surface, but wow, I have a weird feeling. You know, a weird feeling about that person. I'm not, not sure why, but some way. Make sure I pay attention. Okay. For what am I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? This is Paul talking about the people in the church. Our, the whole context of the passage here is about the necessity of judging without being judgmental. Okay? And that, that, only, is, that only is available to us if we're, if we're moving in the spirit. You can't, be, you can't judge without being judgmental in the flesh. Not, not humanly impossible. Not humanly impossible. But let me tell you what. If, if you've got a vertical, right, the horizontal comes into play. We talked about the two verses that were God, where Jesus lined that up for us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all of your heart. In, in uh, mind and soul. And then love your neighbor as yourself. See, the first one is the vertical. If you love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your spirit, then loving your neighbor as yourself becomes a pretty simple exchange because you're judging rightly. You're doing everything that you're supposed to do. One who's able to use the word of God to divide between soul and spirit, joints and mind, just like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 suggests. Yes. Oh, Gad. Yep, that's the next one. <laughs> Gad shall be attacked by raiding bands, but he shall raid at their heels. Mm -hmm. Gad settled on the, uh, the east bank of the Jordan River, one of the three tribes that settled on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak. And they were constantly bothered by those raiding tribes, always. But unlike Issachar, well, I told you I would tell you a different story. Unlike Issachar, they defended their until, all the way up until Assyria conquered them and carried them all along. So that the missing, the tribes went missing. Now, this Christian type, very important that we understand, that this Christian type, this is something that we're all going to resemble in the end. These are overcomers. These are the folks that, that man, no matter what happens, 
no matter what is thrown at them, they're always bouncing back. They're always, they're always overcoming. It's like, what disaster's next? Not good matter. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna work it out. They're gonna figure it out. They're gonna overcome anything that is thrown at them because they are doing it with the power of the Lord. For whoever's born of God overcomes the world. And the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. Who is that that overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's interesting to note that uh, if you look at the Jordanian city of Petra, well, some of you guys may have visited Petra, or at least you know where Petra is. Or if you watch the, the, the Indiana Jones movie, uh, yeah. the Holy Grail, you know, that's, that's Petra. Uh, Petra is actually written about in the book of Revelation as the place in the desert where the Israelites are going to flee from the Antichrist. They're going to overcome the attacks of the Antichrist by going to the city of Petra, around the city of Petra in the desert. Guess where the city of Petra is located? In whose tribal lands is the city of Petra? We will all be overcomers. And God calls us all to be overcomers right now. If you believe in the Son of God, you are owed to overcome the world. You are to put aside all of the lusts of the flesh and the things that the, the world draws you to, and you are to be a dad. You are to be that type. It's something he is, he's calling us to just as we speak. All right, so we, let's look at Asher. Asher. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Ooh, something like a good meal, right? All right, so Asher, this tribe's territory was on the northern coast, uh, bordering Lebanon. It's right up there at the very, very tip of the Mediterranean Sea. Very, very rich land. Very, very beautiful country. This type of Christian, the one that's going to look like the type that is Asher. You know, they are full of spiritual blessings. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be any of them. It could just be the fact that you have been given so much fruit that you don't even know what to do with it, so you're giving it away. You're providing the delicacies to other people. Uh, this is what an Asher type does. You know, they give away to their fellow brothers and sisters, and even unto the world, they give and they give and they give. This is the gift of giving. An Asher type has the gift of giving. Many of us know some of those people. We're just all of us, you know. Yeah, what can I do for you? Oh, what can I do for you? you know, just that is their spirit. They are the they're an Asherite by type. Great people, wonderful people. They receive blessings and they give blessings. What it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be a fun. That's that's what we're all supposed to do. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will men give unto you. But with measure you use, it will be measured unto you. So those Ashers, those Asherites, you know, they're giving, and yet God is giving back and giving them more and doing more things for them and giving more spiritual blessings and giving them more fruit because they're doling it out just like they're supposed to. Nephilim is a dough set loose. He gives beautiful. Does any word picture that you can think of talk about freedom more than a dove set loose? Have you ever watched videos of deer that's just prancing and you know, it's got some tasty meadow grass there beneath it and they just flip and flip around? And, you know, it, it, that's, that is the essential look of freedom. That is a word picture of absolute freedom. We also know that this type is eloquent in speech. Many of Jesus' disciples. Those that he chose, this is, this is where they came from. We know that all but one of them was Galilee. So three, three tribes in Galilee, you know, with parts in Galilee. So many of Jesus' disciples were from this tribe. They were, you know, although they were fishermen and tax collectors and those kind of things, they became the preachers, the preeminent preachers of the world. 
really kick-started the church. It's also interesting that a great deal of Jesus' teaching was spent in this region, this place. So, there's this Christian type seen here is one that's truly been set free from the cures of this world and is engaged in spreading the gospel as their first and primary condition. You know that person that's just like, yeah, there's the world, and then there's, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the gospel. Let me tell you what matters. Let me tell you what he did for you. Let me tell you what he did for me. Let me tell you who he is. These are all, you know, these are all the folks that are within that group. The type of that So how do we work on evangelists and preachers and people who that is like, they just can't help it. It's just like, it's like, you know, give me five seconds and I'm talking to you and it, and it just starts, it's like, it's like, I can't keep it in the mouth. I can't keep, you know, it's like, let me just tell you, these are the type of people. We should all want to have that type within us. We should all long and yearn to have that type within us. We want to talk about our Lord and Savior as much as you would possible. Okay, so the last two, these are the, the, the sons of Rachel. The archers bitterly attacked him. They shot at him. He hated it, but his bow remained firm. His arms were agile because of the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. Because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of the God of your fathers who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with weapons and blessings from heaven above. Blessings from the deep that lies with you. The blessings of the breasts of the womb. The blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my fathers, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They will be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was set apart from his brothers. Now, if it actually happened like our picture, and you had 12, 12 guys standing around the bed at the time, and you know, we, we've read a few of these already, you know, can you imagine when he spoke this? Now, they probably were kind of understanding that's the way it was going to come because they had likewise been saved from the drought in Canaan by their brother Joseph who they had sown in the soil. They, they had you know, probably understood that you know, he was a real blessing and he was set apart from his brothers. They probably understood that. I want you to think about what you see and what Jacob is talking to his son about. We know that he went through so many difficulties but he was always faithful, and it was God that brought him to you. Every place in here, everything that Jacob was talking to was, was the Lord. It was, it was that Jacob remained faithful. He remained close to the source his entire life. And therefore, he was used mightily of God to be able to do many, many things. And, and provided the actual salvation for Israel. The salvation of Israel came through Joseph. So, in, in, a, in a spiritual sense, this is the ideal Christian. Because it incorporates every gift. It incorporates every other good thing about the Father's blessings. Remaining close to the source. Remaining close to our Father God. Keeping ourselves plugged in. Is the main component of living a life that is a type of Joseph's. And the interesting thing about Joseph is that blessings flowed to all of the people of Israel, but blessings also flowed outside the walls of salvation. Egypt was greatly blessed by what Joseph did. If you are looking like this type, people will ask you. And they can come out funny. You're crazy, dude. <laughs> What's wrong with you? you know? But, but if you give an account for the hope that's within you, what's the hope that's within us? Jesus Christ. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and essence, by which he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through these things you might become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. For this reason, make every effort to add virtue to your faith, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge self-control, and to your self-control patient endurance, 
and to your patient endurance godliness, and to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to your brotherly kindness love. For if these things reside in you and abound, that they ensure that you will neither be useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the one who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, because he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. I mean, this is a this is a long list of stuff. You know, and you, you, some of these are, are you know, these are tall orders, and you can only accomplish these things if you are a Joseph, if you are plugged in to the Lord, if you are accounting for His power through you. Can't you just this is this is too tall an order for us to do. Can only come for us after Joseph. And finally, we have Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey, and at night, he divides the spoil. This is another type that we should avoid. <laughs> now, you know, and again, a lot of good people came to try and we know, you know Paul himself was a good so a lot of good people come from the tribe of Benjamin. So understand this is a spiritual thing and not a physical thing. So not, not all Benjamites are bad. The original one is kind of the way he was, so it's now a spiritual thing that we have to look at. Um, so spiritually, we're talking about a discontented Christian. Someone who is not content. Someone who's always looking for and finding fault with others. No matter how much this type of Christian is given to or ministered to, they always want more and they're never satisfied. They always want something to change. They always want something to be different. And nothing is ever good enough. I don't like the color of the room. I didn't like any of the songs. You know, I mean, it, I mean really, it's a discontent to a, to a degree that actually almost becomes insane. Our flesh is naturally discontent. It's something that we just have to deal with. It's like we are, we are discontented, but we're called to be contented in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 13 clearly says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Listen, in the context of that verse, Paul is talking about some horrible circumstances. I can do all of those things through Christ who strengthens me. He tells us, Paul tells us that he has found the way of being content. I've had much, I've had little, I've had nothing. And because of the surpassing love of Jesus Christ, I'm good. No matter what happens, no matter what takes place, no matter how bad of, of a hand you feel like you've been dealt, it is possible. It is possible to have that kind of spirit. It is possible. Yeah. And don't forget, don't forget this. It's the grumbling spirit. The desert that God was like, you know, I had enough of these people. We're done. You know, you guys have you guys have complained. I gave you water, I gave you manna, I gave you quail. Your shoes didn't wear out for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world was wrong with you people? I'm done. You're not gonna get your You gotta remember that that's what. That is what subjected all of those people who died in the desert to die in the desert. Well, remember, that's a picture for all of us. It's a picture for all of us. We all got to on the lips, okay? Because a lot of times these, you know, these, these folks that are you know, disgruntled, you know, I mean, they're, they're struggling with things. We have to remember that every single one of us is born in progress. Every one of us is being sanctified. We are all being made in the image of Christ. You know, some of us are crawling, some of us are jackrabbits, but they're all, we all have one thing in common. We all have one thing in common as we are being saved. We have to remember that even as we pray for the people that we know that are discontented, or as ourselves, as we pray for ourselves, that God would help pull us out of this pit of despair. That's what we remember. We've all sinned for sure before God. Every single solitary person is a sinner. It's come short of glory of God and yet in his great love. While and yet we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Died for them. Died for everybody. So we, have, we must be contented in our place. We won't take them in debt. We won't leave them in debt. 
or we will have the, the Benjamin type. We're all sinners navigating the waters to get saved. So, what type of Christian are you? Praising and courageous or unstable? Comforting and consoling or self willed Cunning and sharp, dealing with the enemy or timid? Overcoming or self oppressed? Blissful or discontent? Joyful, faithful, those things that we are called to be in obedience, does that look more like your type? Look in God's mirrors. Look in God's mirrors. He's set down a whole bunch of things for us to take a look at. Look in God's mirror this morning and see if you see yourself. And you see if that type is pleasing to our Lord. If it's not, and you don't like what you see, then you know, Time for a change. We talked about it. It is possible to change. This is like a shirt. You know, you can take it off and get another one. That one might be a little smelly. I'm going to let it take it off. Don't put it on the floor in the room. It's not what we think. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you.